Good afternoon. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of APAC News Network, the third uh, global education and skills conclave. My name is Rajneesh and I'm the editor of APAC News Network. Uh, so now uh, we had a very uh, fruitful inaugural session in the morning with a lot of the government policymakers from the education side as well as the industry side discussing on the different uh, uh, roadmaps for education and how technology can play a role mm -hmm. there. Uh, so now uh, we have a session on basically how the new education policy uh, the NEP can transform tomorrow's school education. And for this, uh, the, this discussion would be moderated by Dr. Nita Bali. Uh, she is a director principal of GD Gwenka World School Gurgaon. Uh, and I would hand it over to you, uh, Nita, to introduce all the panelists and uh, uh, take forward this discussion. Over to you, Nita. Thank you. Thank you, Rajneesh. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome to this discussion. I'm sure there have been multiple discussions on NEP uh, in the previous sessions as well. This is going to be a very focused discussion, and I'm really happy to welcome very illustrious uh, guests on this panel. We have Mr. Roshan Gandhi, uh, CEO, City Montessori uh, School, Lucknow. Welcome, Roshan. It's such a pleasure to see you again. Uh, we always shared space in the other uh, forums also, but lovely to meet you again. Uh, we have uh, Srinivas and Sriram, Principal, the Mount School. Um, is he there? No, he's not there, not yet joined us. We have Nidhi Thapar, uh, Vice President, Head Academics, Education, Education Services, Private Limited, uh, Bangalore. Uh, welcome, uh, Nidhi. Uh, we have Dr. Samiola, CEO, Manipal Academy of Health and Education, Bangalore. Uh, I welcome you. We have uh, Mr. Dan Curry, Director and Principal, Vega Schools, Gurgaon. And we have Ms. Annie Williams, uh, Principal, Modern School, Greta Noida. I welcome each one of you to this session. And I do hope that this is going to be an interesting session, uh, an interactive session, one that you will enjoy speaking um, about various uh, facets of NEP and that I'll enjoy uh, moderating. Uh, to begin with, just a few quick things before we start on our discussions. It'll be nice if uh, we can speak for about five to seven minutes, giving everyone an opportunity to um, be able to contribute effectively. Uh, let us not overshoot the time in our enthusiasm, though I know when teachers start speaking particularly, I think there's just no stopping them. Nevertheless, I think uh, the good idea, <laughs> uh, Nidhi is having, uh, uh, she, she has a smile on her face. I'm sure she understands what I'm trying to say. So um, let us restrict ourselves to five to seven minutes so that everybody gets an opportunity to uh, express their views um, and put forward um, their, uh, their, their points effectively. Uh, of course, uh, the topic for today's discussion is how the new education policy or NEP 2020 will transform tomorrow's school education which it is meant to transform. And let me start by um, asking Roshan um, a quick question. Roshan, in fact, uh, one of the clauses in the NEP says very clearly uh, that we're expanding, expanding student age group uh, benefit most children because over 85% of a child's brain uh, development occurs prior to the age of six, indicating the critical importance of appropriate care and stimulation of the brain in the early years in order to ensure healthy brain development and growth. So, Roshan, what is your point of view on how will expanding the age group of uh, mandatory schooling benefit the children? And do you think our schools are really geared up uh, to inculcate this uh, kind of preschool training which will benefit the children? Over to you, Roshan. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, for, for inviting me here, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, very good question about the early years and the expansion of the age group in the NEP. I think we have to always start by reminding ourselves, who does this NEP apply to? Because it applies to all schools in the country, in theory. And usually in these forums with panelists uh, here, probably with the audience members, we all probably represent 
a certain strata of schools, which might actually represent the top 10 to 20% um, performing schools in the country at best. Uh, whereas the reality of schools, of the majority of the schools in this country are either, of course, government schools or uh, low fee budget private schools. And in those schools, one has to really think, you know, what, what kind of outcomes are being delivered as it is. Um, and then the question, you know, the, the debate remains is should it be a priority right now to be focusing on expanding the provision to early years? Or should it be a priority to first fix what is going on in the, uh, the elementary and, and junior and senior years uh, before trying to expand further? Because I think uh, what we're seeing, you know, across the education sector is a, is a picture where uh, outcomes are pretty weak uh, across the government schools and budget private schools. Learning outcomes are weak. Um, you know, the infrastructure is not up to the mark. Uh, it's questionable whether teachers are attending school or not. Um, and so these are deep structural issues uh, that have to be solved through accountability of teachers and of schools. Um, that is something which is a little bit lacking in the NEP. Um, through a real focus on learning outcomes, again, you know, that, that's slightly lacking in the NEP. Uh, before we can think about really kind of delivering a cutting edge best practices and before we can think about then expanding the provision, because if you expand a weak provision, uh, you just get more weak provision and, and it's questionable how beneficial that would be. Having said that, of course, you know, there is immense value in, uh, you know, in, in, in make, giving a structured educational process in the early years. There is a lot of research to suggest that those are formative, key formative years and, and children need to spend that time. Uh, wisely, although even that research is a little bit mixed. Um, you know, different countries in the world do things differently. Um, you know, if you look at country of Finland, uh, I believe you know we we all understand Finland to be a, a model of one of the best education systems in the world. Uh, but there, they don't have uh, you know compulsory early years education, right? So you know, why is that? They 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 are also a very uh, research driven. Um, you know, education system, uh, but the research is not absolutely clear yet on the effect of early years education or what sort of early years education is needed um, to, to ensure child development at that stage. So I think basically, it, you know, one, one should encourage the expansion of education to all children, provided that, you know, we are able to deliver actual quality and that requires a lot more structural changes on top of the expansion of education, and provided that we are really focusing on the type of education at early years that is actually going to contribute uh, to child development. If I have time, just uh, 30 seconds more, um, in the early years, we have a, we have a habit of um, pursuing a pretty traditional method um, you know, for example, teaching kids uh, grammar when in fact they should be spending, when they're doing language learning, they should be doing more mother tongue uh, learning, they should be doing more, um, you know, conversing and, and listening and storytelling and this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, if we expand an early years provision, that's all well and good, but we need to make sure we're giving the right early years provision, otherwise it's counterproductive to progress. Uh, thank you, Roshan. I think that is really well said. And what you said about um, having a structured approach uh, will add immense value. I think you had a point there. And you also spoke about the Finnish education where there is no emphasis on the early years education. But one has yet to gauge the impact of um, not having an, uh, a model where there are no early, where there is no early years education. Um, so I think it's a matter of trial and error over a period of time. Over um, a period of time, one would see the cumulative effect of how having or not having early years education is going to impact the education of children. I'll come back to you, Roshan, for further inputs. Uh, let me now go to um, uh, perhaps to Dr. Sami Ola, uh, CEO of Manipal Academy of Health and Education, uh, Bangalore. Uh, and I want to talk about... Um, in the NEP, um, in fact, there is a lot of talk about reducing the importance of board exams. And it says, are schools really ready for a more informed system in a blended mode of uh, teaching learning? Will the board exams of grade 10 and 12 be continued? That is, the existing system of uh, board and entrance examinations are going to be reformed. Um, to eliminate the need for taking coaching classes. And 
Will this um, probably have any harmful impact on the current assessment system? So how is the assessment shifting from a content-based assessment to competency-based uh, assessment? There, there seems to be um, a lot of talk about shifting uh, the assessment from content-heavy assessment or content-based assessment where uh, students are expected to uh, depend on rote learning and regurgitating in an examination. Are we moving from that to a more competency-based uh, system of assessment? What are your views uh, on this, um, Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Samula? Thank you very much, Dr. Nisa. Uh, good afternoon to everyone and my fellow panelists. Uh, at the outset, let me thank Mr. Shubham and the entire APEC team for organizing this event. Now, coming to the assessment part, um, see, uh, before that, I will just want to further talk about the, the formative stage while thereafter come to the assessment. So the whole uh, division that is happening, the five, four stages that uh, has been formed in, in uh, the NEP, like five plus three plus three plus four, uh, keeping in the mind a lot of researchers which has gone into the uh, various stages of a child's learning uh, uh, behavior or child's learning competencies. Okay, and um, uh, that's how the five years and three years and three years. The beginning, the first stage is the foundation stage that we are talking about. Uh, this lot of countries do have, um, uh, have a formative stage and also foundational stage and many countries also do not have. But the whole uh, concept of adding this as a formal education system by NAP was to, uh, you know, we have we have gone into uh, the research wage uh, below seven years. That's the, that's the prime uh, age. And 80% um, of the brain, you know, the formation of the brain, including even if you get into the neurology of it, uh, you know, is, is formed. 90% is from uh, at, by the age of uh, five to six years. And that's the peak of his uh, learning capacity. So good that it has been brought into a formal system, this foundation stage of five years and uh, five and up to eight years. That is how the class one and two came into the picture. Now the assessment coming to the assessment part, which is very, very key for any, uh, it's, it's for a learning uh, uh, process. So without, of course, assessment, you will never know how to measure how the, how the learning is happening. Yes, there are various forms of assessment. Now, NEP talks about the competency-based assessment. It, it, is, it is derived more of fall learning, you know, not as or after learning. It's, it's fall learning. So before even we start the learning process, NEP talks about, you know, how to measure uh, with respect to competency. The competency includes many things like the skills uh, uh, such as reading, writing, the numeracy skills, the mathematical thinking skills, uh, higher order thinking skills, or, you know, communication and collaboration all this is becomes part of it which of course a lot of still studies are going on and nep is yet to come out with what exactly they mean by the competency base but overall overall it means to say that the rote learning kind of uh, the assessment will no more be there uh, there is there there are three other levels of uh, of, of finding the uh, the competency skills the, they are talking about one in the in the, in the grade of 3 another the fifth grade, eighth grade. So this is more again for fall learning to see what is happening in that in that during the previous years. So are they geared up for the next level of uh, uh, learning process? So this is more for till now, all the assessments has been, even if you take formative or summative assessments, more of off learning, what has happened. Now it is what should we be done? You know, what is the stage with how much competency has been acquired by the child um, and and how to take it further more? How to take it, uh, you know, uh, further? So this is the whole uh, reason for introducing this competency base. Now, of course, we are talking about the government is talking about, um, uh, you know, even um, making the secondary board exams also uh, not so stringent. Uh, we'll have all the child will an option to choose the subjects. It is no more that what is defined by the board only those subjects will be. Uh, asked to be written so it will be the, the 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 child has a choice so he can also take arts he can also take uh, uh, physical education to uh, you know uh, take up the exams the board exams and again he'll get two chances one of course he 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 writes and second after that he also can go for an improvement level so 
and and it has become very light it's not as heavy as what we are talking about again it's still in the stage of being uh, formed and the, the whole onus will be on the state so uh, if you say nep nep is only a policy it's only a direction it's only a framework it's up to the state government to incorporate it into their um, into their system so how many state governments have already started working on it but lot many are still evaluating in the evaluation stage if you really see so board exams again will be redesigned it will be more of a holistic development it will be less of um, less of rote memorization it will have more of uh, uh, maybe mcqs it will have more of descriptive type high order skill uh, it will also incorporate uh, it will be easier of course and it will incorporate um, you know a lot of um, uh, subject level application level uh, uh, questions more of descriptive okay and of course even even the uh, uh, this one um, whatever they have done in the regular uh, classrooms also will be part of the board exam so nc and and they have already started uh, the nep talks about parak uh, which gives a direction which starts mapping the entire uh, of a child like like how we are talking about aadhar child also will be will get into that parak from the age of 3 3 and half and and the software through its various uh, ai tools and um, uh, ml tools will find out how the learning is happening so yes it's a good step i, I think the assessment has been really getting trans transformed but one one thing we always should remember is how are we going to train the teachers in in this part you know so will will this um, understand so ultimately uh, the performance uh, comes back to the teacher level whether the teacher uh, understands what is required by her has she been trained uh, can she find out how to evaluate a child all all this is is a very key very important part so here again i repeat the most important part is how the teacher can be trained to either uh, for the learning process for the evaluation process for for the delivery process so yeah so Thank you so much. Uh, if there's anything else, I'm, I, I can take the questions. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Samyoda. I think that was very, very beautifully expressed when you spoke about uh, the fact that uh, assessment should be assessment of learning, um, and not after learning. Uh, I think the assessment should be an ongoing process. Assessment should be something that should not cause the kind of pressure, immense pressure that uh, students generally feel. um in terms of you know when they have to write a board examination um so i think you spoken about parak so beautifully cumulative assessment assessment that um, tests uh, essentially uh, the competencies and skills uh, you spoke about the numeracy skills and of course the linguistic skills but apart from that i think the other uh, competencies that also need to be inbuilt into assessment um testing um you know what whether the children have picked up skills of resilience as well because of late what we have seen of our lives is that the only thing that is constant is change and uncertainty so the ability to deal with uh, the uncertainty the ability to uh, to manage uh, something which is not foreseen i think those skills also need to be developed perhaps somewhere sure. when we speak about the hidden curriculum uh that's where i think we need to be testing for these as well uh but yeah. thank you so much for sharing your views on how assessment needs to change and assessment should essentially be uh trying to figure out whether the children have learned how to learn uh not an assessment of how much have they assimilated in terms of uh content uh, that is there in the books and will it stand them in good stead in the years to come uh will it serve a purpose the assessment of the skills that will these skills serve a purpose uh will it prepare them for the life uh, ahead i think that's what assessment should be all about thank you so much dr samuel for sharing uh let me now go to nidhi thapar and um, nidhi um nep says that in all stages experiential learning will be adopted including hands on learning arts integrated and sports integrated education story telling based pedagogy among other things and uh, among others as well as standard pedagogy within each subject and with exploration of relations amongst different subjects so nidhi i'd like you to dwell a little on how geared are the faculty to impart um, more experiential learning in a regular 
and vocational streams. Over to you, Nidhi. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Nita, for the question. And uh, good afternoon to everyone here. I think first, at the outset, what I would like to clarify here, you know, what exactly is experience learning? And what it is just not, it is not just learning by doing. And that's the connotation of it that is largely uh, accepted or construed as. And that's one misconception that needs to be done away with at the right at the beginning, I think. I think uh, the whole idea of experiential learning starts with learning by doing and moves on to reflection. What happened? Why it happened? making linkages uh, with what you know prior and what you have experienced. Basis those linkages, forming hypothesis, and then applying it all together. I think that's the entire cycle of experiential learning. And uh, one thing which we will need to understand while we try to take this ahead is we all are aware, you know, the Diksha app and the multitude of trainings that have been released on this app and uh, have been made mandatory, teachers to do uh, 50 hours of training and so on and so forth. And uh, the experiential learning was made mandatory and the success rate or the completion rate as uh, stated is considered very high vis-a-vis -vis the other trainings. Let me tell you what that percentage is. That's 40%. This is the state of a mandatory training. And this is only the training part. I'm still not gone to the implementation part of it. Right? So now having said that, uh, we all, whenever I think educationists like us and senior members are co-educators, we get on panel discussions. We talk a lot about uh, the pitfalls of our curriculum, the uh, shortcomings of pedagogy, et cetera. But at the same time, I think what uh, Mr. Roshan said in the beginning, yes, we may be making up the, that small segment of 10 or 20%, but what stops us from taking the lead on this? Where, where is the hitch there? Uh, trust me when I tell you at Ryan Education, we're trying to reach the district education officers and telling them that uh, we, the teams of Ryan Education, are ready to train your teachers. We want to do that and we want to do it as an initiative just to see what we can do, uh, you know, for the fraternity here. So are the teachers uh, really ready to do it? I think it's a journey which has just about started. And uh, though the modules that have been set up, I think there's lots more that needs to be done here. Platforms will have to be created where knowledge exchange happens where, uh, you know, very constructive discussion happens on what's working and what's not working. Because until and unless that happens, we will all continue to believe that we are best in the business and we are doing what we need to do. But there's a larger segment who's absolutely unaware of what's happening. So there's a lot of teacher training that needs to happen, undoubtedly. But for me, that is... Uh, is that uh, the end? I think that's means to an end. That's just uh, the beginning. And uh, the bigger question here is, mm -hmm. are we as uh, educators ready to collaborate together to make this change in the better interest of these students? I think that's the common thread which ties it all together. We are all here for children. So can we do that? Can we reach out to 10 different schools in our vicinity and see how we take our best practices and take draw out from their best practices? Because until and unless this happens, all this shall remain on paper. As uh, you know, I was earlier even said, the state, some states government have taken steps towards it. Some states are still deliberating over it. The government will really do what it has to do. We are even revamping the entire teaching, uh, teacher training uh, modules, right? The, uh, which are the B ed courses that are there. But do we wait for that kind of a change to come in? Because we know today as we sit across, one word answer, Neeta, to your question is, are our teachers ready for it? I don't think they are. Do they have the ability for it? Yes, they do. So the, the intent is there, the ability is there. 
I think it is uh, taking that, uh, you know, step from each one of us and not limiting ourselves to our set of schools, but expanding our horizons and taking it larger. So that's the way I take it, Neera. Thank you, Nidhi. Um, I think that was very well expressed. And what I really liked uh, about what you spoke of and as somebody who heads an international school, um, I think a lot of what you said makes a lot of sense to us. You spoke about reflection. Uh, generally, in the international curricula, and I'm sure everybody's aware that um, reflection is uh, definitely, you know, when we talk about a cat Murdoch cycle, inquiry cycle, reflection is an inevitable and integral part of learning. Uh, speaking about, you know, what you have learned and why you've learned it. And what, what benefit have you derived from learning what you have learned? Reflecting on that is, is very significant. That was one uh, thing that, you know, struck me as something that uh, should be there right across all kinds of curricula, whether it is the national curricula or the international curricula, but it sounded very familiar and therefore I'm speaking about it. The other thing that you spoke about is um, uh, trainings. A uh, lot of us um, talk about, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of schools talk about experiential teaching, learning, so on and so forth. But to what degree are we doing it with efficacy is a matter of question. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a question to dwell on. Um, so I think trainings, uh, as you very rightly said, are our teachers are across the board well prepared to execute or to, to transact experiential learning? Perhaps not. But are they willing to? Most certainly, yes. So I think there is need for aggressive training and more training uh, to ensure that uh, we are able to transact experiential learning. Um, so I, I quite agree with you with that. Um, however, I also feel that uh, with experiential learning, the learning tends to stay longer probably than learning from a book. Um, when a teacher becomes a facilitator in uh, creating and experience and particularly so when um, there is provocation in the classroom and students are um, forced to think and ask questions uh, and using provocation beautifully in a classroom I think you can definitely lead them gently into um, experiential learning and I really feel that that's the kind of learning that stays but thank you for sharing your views so beautifully Nidhi let me now um, go to um, Mr. Dan Curry, Director and Principal, Vega Schools, uh, Gurga. Uh, Dan, I have a question for you here. Um, in fact, um, you know, uh, NEP talks about um, multidisciplinary, flexible choice of subjects in classes 9 to 12. Multidisciplinary, flexible choice of subjects in classes 9 to 12. Unlike compartmentalization of subjects into uh, science, uh, humanities, or commercial studies. Um, so I, I'd like you to speak about uh, this perhaps, uh, Dan. I mean, what is, how do you look at this? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, it is good to be here and to hear um, such good thoughts from my peers. And I'm, it's great. My brain is thinking now and I've got to refocus on the question I've been asked because I'm really uh, enjoying the, what I've heard so far. You know, in terms of the choice of, uh, of elective, the choice of, of courses, you know, I think that that's really uh, where we see a lot of international schools. So, and I'm an American, in American schools, we see this where we don't have the silos where students, if they pick a track early, then, then that's it, they've committed. Um, I think it's important, especially in a fairly young age, to be able to experience psychology, maybe some hard sciences, some chemistry, maybe some uh, vocational kinds of things, they're still exploring. These students are still exploring to understand their strengths, maybe do a ceramics class, uh, explore that creative side of them. And uh, there, you know, there should be an allowance for them to sample uh, the variety of, of curricula out there. I think that leads to more well-rounded people. And I think once they, uh, once they settle on the course that they want to do, then they're more committed to it. Whereas if they've joined early on in their secondary career to a track, maybe they realize, you know, this, this isn't for me. 
We're all about options. It's good. Uh, we're happy to provide that. Now, how do we build that into a system? For schools to offer a variety schedule to make that work logistically. Certainly for the students, it's better uh, to have those options to and to build, build up the schools. And I think it's in the I think Dan is having a bit of a problem with his network. Uh, but I think uh, taking uh, this forward, whatever Dan just said about, uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, we need to have a, a multidisciplinary, flexible choice of subjects in grades 9 to 12. Uh, to some of us who are with international schools, uh, that's a done deal. Because uh, you don't compartmentalize, um, you know, studies into, let us say, commercial studies or humanities or um, science. Um, but you get to choose different permutations and combinations. For example, my school runs, the school that I head runs uh, the International Baccalaureate um, Accredited Programs, the IB Diploma, the SNA levels. So you have permutation and combinations. You could be studying physics with music and art, um, as well as business studies. Apart from that, you're also doing something called cast creativity, activity, and service. We're supposed to clock a certain number of hours, offering you a whole gamut of experiences. Um, so I think there is a huge advantage there, one, because um, it's it's only, uh, you know, in the post-secondary education that you start to specialize. And you can dabble in different things and then figure out what is it that you're good at and finally decide what is it that you wish to study. In fact, this spills over also in the po to the post-secondary education at the college level. A lot of colleges do offer, as Dan said, um, you know, uh, maybe a class in art or maybe a class in, you know, uh, sport, uh, maybe a class in ceramics, along with a class in physics and um, hardcore sciences and maybe uh, commercial studies. Uh, Dan, would you like to continue um, talking about what you were talking about? Sure. Yes. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, internet internet issues. I'm sure we're all familiar with those. Uh, yes. And as you've said, uh, you know, that creates a well-rounded person. They have those options and they're still exploring. And the skills that they learn can still be technical skills. So in, you know, if we're offering, uh, let's say, a ceramics class, there's still ways to incorporate mathematics, science, history, uh, beyond art, you know, all these things are multidisciplinary. So in exploring different subjects, they're making deeper connections with the rest of the curriculum. So nothing is really should be taught in isolation. Um, these all these all blend together and uh, really supports just like our, our brains, the more our neurons connect and make a web of connections as we explore different subjects in different areas, we start to make those connections and we see, we can compare and contrast between, you know, how this particular product is made in an art format versus the architecture of a building. Um, so I think those are all good ways to create uh, inquisitiveness in our, in our learners and our students and uh, really inspire them to go beyond and to pursue a variety of interests. Again, thank you. Sorry for the, thank for the you, Dan. dropping thank off. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Annie, let me come to you now, Miss Annie Williams, um, a principal of modern school grade in Oida. Annie, and I want to talk about the three language formula. Um, how significant is the three language formula that is being propagated by NEP 2020 to promote the spirit of secularism and national unity? And a more important question, perhaps, how will the schools balance this three language formula and having mother tongue as a mode of instruction? That, that, is, that is something I think that we need to speak about. How will we manage having mother tongue as a mode of instruction? You know, how will it affect the children? Annie, can you hear me? Uh, very good evening to all of you. Am I clear, audible? 
Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, so I was hearing with uh, to all uh, panelists here, and a lot of inputs have come, and it's a very apt question regarding the language, three language, because Greater Noida is the western part of UP. So here it is more relevant when we are talking about our children, and then uh, North India, as we say, Hindi, English, and there are many mother tongues like. Area to area, so how we are going to use my third language as a mother tongue language? So first of all, you have to understand it is not compulsory. As many think that it's a compulsory that it's compulsory that we should use the third language, it is not compulsory, but it is uh, you know preferred in case the child is uh, not having a language or understanding of the. english language as it is a third language or a second language in some parts of india now the concept is that the subjects where the concept or understanding is required there i think in my view we should use the mother tongue and that is more appropriate because the concept and understanding will be clear whereas languages learning of languages is for communication so there communication has to be we cannot do translation methods i i think uh, many of you will agree that we cannot have english to hindi translation and hindi to english or tamil or bengali because translation you know dilutes the uh, you know essence of that language so here we i, I as a person as a principal in a, in this area i would talk about this which is more relevant that in india we have so many languages and mother tongue will save us to give the concept because that will help us to understand the competencies when we understand the competencies that means with what we are trying to give is the skills the cognitive skill the understanding the behavioral change it will only come when we are able to communicate so first point is to communicate and that to in early stages preferably which nep has told and later when the child develops the method or you know understanding of the language he or she can opt for higher education in the that language as others we see that like ias and upscs and others exams are also coming in the local languages now so we have to develop a lot of uh, literature in the mother tongue first to keep it on and take it to the next level of education and at the basis yes again it will be you know we cannot isolate the subjects but we have to communicate when we say interdisciplinary education in that both mother tongue and the language of communication like for private schools mostly it is english and that has to be uh, you know i would say hybrid language there that we have to use all the languages which is acceptable and understandable even by the state governments state government schools are run with uh, they they are teaching the languages like punjab is teaching punjabi marathi uh, maharashtra is teaching marathi so the mother language helps the child the parent who is not may he may not be educated to at least understand and connect with the child what he is learning so i think uh, that is main point what we will uh, three uh, three language system will help us thank you yeah thank you anya i think uh, you've got a point there when you say that the basic concepts could be taught in the mother tongue uh because the simulation will be easier because mother tongue is something that comes very naturally to most kids so understanding perhaps uh, would be much easier rather than teaching it in uh, a language which they're not familiar with i i quite agree with you uh brushel let me just come back to you and i have an important question to ask you uh nep is talking a lot about education of gifted children education of the gifted or for the gifted children what is your view of, um, on on that how how do you think we can educate the gifted because there are a lot of gifted students uh, how should they be treated differently and what kind of education should we provide them well yeah it, again it's about how we go about it how are we defining who is gifted um you know because it, it, it there's a danger right of course you want to be able to give opportunities to those who show greater ability in certain areas that they should be empowered to challenge themselves and really stretch and advance their learning maybe learn faster go ahead of where they are but at the same time you know if you label a particular set of children as gifted that implies that you're labeling another set of children as less gifted and that can be a problem 
so there needs to be a very rigorous method of evaluating, you know, who is who are the so-called gifted children, and of continuously evaluating that, and of constantly giving uh, every child the opportunity um, to be put, you know, to 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 find themselves in that category. Um, and then, you know, they should not be really given major differential treatment. I think certain subjects lend themselves more to, uh, you know, stretch learning than other subjects. Um, you know, mathematics is a bit like that, that you can kind of complete a mathematics syllabus a year early or something if you happen to be, um, you know, well-versed in maths at a particular level. Um, and then you can, you can uh, tackle more advanced mathematical concepts at the school level, potentially. Uh, but other subjects, you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter so much. There are certain competencies that you're looking to attain. Uh, for example, in, in English, you know, in, in each year there are certain competencies that have to be attained, certain kind of uh, reading ability that you want children to have, certain writing ability that you want children to have. The assessment of these things is, uh, of course, rigorous, but relatively subjective, unlike in maths, where it's entirely objective. Um, and so it's it becomes dangerous to try to differentiate kids too much. Um, I also think that you know a skilled teacher uh, would have the ability to teach in a differentiated manner even within their own class uh, without having to separate you know gifted children into another set and less gifted children into a different set. Um, they would be able to plan their interventions in such a way that they can do that. And I think they will be further assisted to do that in the near future simply because of the kind of technology that is becoming more and more available. Um, that, you know, when children can do a, a portion of their learning through uh, a technological platform, that platform might be, um, you know, sort of giving them formative assessment as they go, asking them questions, sort of gauging the ch children's performance and uh, collating that data in a, in a way that's very accessible to teachers to help them understand where they need to intervene uh, for the sake of different children. Um, gifted can mean, you know, some, so occasionally you get children who are truly, you know, they have a, a sharpness of mind that enables them to learn much more at a younger age. Sometimes it's just small differences in pace of learning, you know, a, the, a kid who is maybe uh, a month ahead, the other kids are going to catch up with them anyway, and it's not a drastic difference. Um, so again, labeling them as a sort of gifted child or something is is something we have to be very careful with. So I think again, you know, giving opportunities to uh, children who are doing very well to stretch themselves is a good thing, provided that it doesn't lead to labeling, differentiating children, and and uh, putting off the children who are not put in that category. And on the flip side, there needs to be support granted and, and, and given to those children who are falling behind for whatever reason. Maybe they have special educational needs. And I think that's something which, you know, as a, as a nation in India, we have not yet given enough attention to um, in terms of assessing specific, perhaps, um, learning disabilities or other special uh, educational needs that children need to have addressed. Or apart from that, they, they might not have a specific diagnosable special need, but they may still, for whatever reason, be falling behind the rest of the class, or they may have uh, difficult circumstances at home, or they may have, you know, missed one concept earlier on in the subject, and then, you know, the later concepts build on that. And although they're capable, but they are, you know, lagging behind because they missed some other concepts. So teachers need to be skilled at understanding the individual needs of children and then supporting them accordingly. Uh, so I, that that's my view in a nutshell. So to follow it in a very uh, careful manner. Mm. Thank you, Roshan. And uh, in fact, I quite agree with you. Um, we've always had parents who have felt that their um, child is a child prodigy. And they've suggested that, <laughs> they've suggested that the child skip a class. <laughs> and that really becomes difficult. Um, you know, to you definitely have to put into place a very rigorous system of assessing and finding out whether it's really worth its while getting a class, getting a child to skip a class. For all you know, the child may fall behind in the years to come. And um, taking on taking what you said, you know, taking that forward, um, NEP is talking a great deal also about um, equitable and inclusive education. So uh, let me let me come to Dan and ask uh, ask you, Dan, what is your view on um, equitable and inclusive education? Roshan just spoke about the fact that there are children, uh, you know, who may need additional support um, and handholding because they they will fall behind if they're not given uh, that kind of handholding and support. Um, in most schools, we do have a certain you know there's this concept of MLL or minimum level of learning. 
so Dan, what do you think about this equitable and inclusive education? Do you think schools should promote um, inclusive education, equitable yeah. education, and how should they do it? Yes, thank you. I, I agree completely with uh, with Roshan about, look, the, the key is in a differentiated classroom, you should be able to handle not just the center, but challenge the students who show in a particular lesson or in a particular area that they have a quick grasp of the concept. So allowances for them to go beyond. And in a differentiated classroom, there should also be allowance for the students who are not quite getting it yet. And that's kind of how we think of it. They haven't gotten it yet. Uh, these ones already have it. So we're not talking about gifted. And I think in terms of giftedness, kind of on that topic, that's, you know, it's a small percentage of those extremely exceptional students. Uh, generally, some student is going to be strong in some area and not as strong in another area. So we're looking at accommodating in, in every classroom, designing our lessons that allow for all learners to be successful to the amount that they're able. And in terms of special education, uh, I come from, you know, the systems I come from are fully included. So uh, that's for us here, even at Vega, we have special needs students who are fully included in our classrooms. Now there are some areas where they need some extra support, so they get extra support, whether it's uh, occupational therapy or some other therapies, math support, some other things to help them. But there's so many benefits for having them, that, uh, to having all students together in one group. You can, you can do interesting things with group work, with group assignments. Uh, students learn to collaborate together with people who may not be um, see the world the way they see it. They learn, to, uh, they learn to appreciate other people's strengths and rely on other people's strengths. And uh, everyone, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats kind of a thing. So everyone really benefits from having fully included classrooms. Uh, that We see research shows that the students who are, who are struggling, uh, the peer learning that they get, the peer support has enormous benefit for, for all students. So they're getting peer support, they're getting teacher support. And, um, and as we know, as teachers, for other peers to teach something to someone, that means they've mastered it. So we that's an evidence of some kind of mastery learning for them if they can turn around and teach it. So, so many benefits to a rich uh, classroom that it can accommodate uh, all, all levels of student, I think is very important. Thank you, Dan. I think you really have a point there. Differentiation in a classroom uh, in one single classroom where you have students of different abilities uh, studying together. I think uh, that makes a huge difference. You spoke about uh, peer learning, children learning from one another. I think that goes a long way uh, because I think they learn well when they learn with their peers. And differentiated um, classrooms, I think, have now almost become a norm. And at the end of the day, I think that the, the purpose of... Um, any kind of uh, mentoring or any kind of intervention per se is always mainstreaming. So you can't really segregate these children and put them in a separate classroom. Of course, you need to have out of the class interventions also sometimes uh, because there, there are times when you, when you need to take them out and give them out of the class interventions, um, which, are, uh, which are not definitely in an inclusive classroom. But then at the end of the day, uh, I think our, our responsibility is to mainstream all such children who may be grappling with a learning uh, difficulty or a learning uh, problem. Um, so that, I think, um, was very, very nicely put on an equitable and inclusive classroom uh, should be one where we promote uh, equality and we promote peer learning um, and the children are made to feel a part of the group rather than being, uh, you know, picked out and secluded and uh, um, should not feel, um, they should not feel alienated. So I, I think uh, this, this definitely, I think, made a lot of sense. What you just said really made uh, a lot of sense. Let me come to Dr. Samula. Let me ask you, um, Dr. Samula, um, about teacher recruitment and career path. Um, the NEP says that um, by um, the end of 2022, um, the NPST or the National Professional Standards Test will be developed um, to ensure that all teachers are competent. What is your take on NPST? Yeah, 
you're on mute, Dr. Samyuda. You're on mute. Sorry, yeah, sorry for that. So yeah, teacher, teacher is a very, uh, as I said earlier, teacher is, forms a very important part of um, you know the whole delivery process. So either we uh, we we have uh, um, uh, online, offline, blended, whatever we call, but key here is the teacher. So um, see, NEP is coming out with many uh, you know uh, different beard courses. Uh, it is talking about uh, teacher centralized. Uh, uh, entrance test and uh, you know uh, lo but but the, here again the challenge is do you have so many teachers here so uh, getting a getting a very well trained teacher is is very very difficult uh, we need to have a very systematic uh, capacity building training programs for them and uh, and and it is uh, uh, the whole process has to be very uh, has to be part of the system so without, if you really want to uh, implement NEP as is and and to achieve the objective, the achieve the uh, the the outcome of this, the main element here is the teacher uh, expertise and uh, how we can go about um, creating that environment of uh, uh, you know continuously imparting this and um, uh, uplifting their uh, know-how and the knowledge. So uh, there are various programs that NEP now talks about uh, how to implement uh, the capacity building exercises for uh, uh, or training programs for the, for the teacher. Uh, here again, see NEP, there are two, two elements here. One is NEP largely talks about the public system, that's the government school. And there are, there's, when we come to the private, it's, it's the private uh, schools or we have to, uh, have our own mechanism here. So NEP doesn't, uh, the state government doesn't, of course, we, CBSE and a lot of IB, we see a lot of training programs and a and, and lot of um, literature content is available and they provide, the help is provided. But how much we have become made it part of the system is, is what is uh, needed today. So uh, getting good teachers is, is not that uh, easy nowadays. And when we are talking about, uh, when NEP talks about getting two crore uh, students, this is, I'm talking about pre-pandemic. And uh, post-pandemic, I'm, I'm sure the numbers are, are very exponentially high. And to get them back into the system, uh, to create that, uh, whatever that cognitive uh, uh, losses have happened in the last one and a half, two years, uh, it, it's a big challenge for the, for the uh, not only as, uh, not only for the private, also to the for the, to the government system here. So yes, uh, teacher uh, training has has been um, uh, is given a lot of importance in NEP, and they talk about um, uh, 16 hours of minimum training required. Uh, vocational training has to be provided. Bilingual uh, training has to be provided. So these are all the facilities or or the provisions that NEP is talking about. But again, um, how the state government. Uh, 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 derives and uh, creates that kind of environment, that kinds of facilities is yet to be seen. But of course, I, if, if you really ask me, the private sector has taken up uh, this in a, in a very uh, serious and in a large way. So uh, we, we have seen Sarva Shikshana, Shikshana Abhyan and uh, uh, Madhya Shikshana Abhyan doing a lot of such trainings. But uh, this is going to be a different level of training when you are talking about competency level, we are talking about critical thinking. Uh, we are talking about uh, analytical thinking, uh, getting uh, uh, getting mother tongue uh, as as the uh, uh, mode of uh, teaching. And again, mother tongue. If you are talking about mother tongue as a as a medium of uh, teaching learning, how many scripts are available for mother tongue? We we know there are beyond ten thousand uh, languages that are uh, you know spoken languages that are there in the country. Now that's again a big challenge. And when NEP says the uh, teacher have to be equipped with bilingual uh, 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 expertise, and how how are we going to implement this? So this is a, a big challenge, and I think uh, we have to see how uh, NCRT, which is doing a lot of uh, 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 development on this, uh, yet to be seen how it will be implemented. But fairly, yes, uh, as a private sector, I think we are doing a good job. Thank you, Dr. Samula. And I quite agree with you when you say that um, as such, you, uh, if you talk about the elite schools, you know, schools that are affiliated to international boards, um, particularly 
there is aggressive teacher training because it's mandated. Every five years, there's a review uh, if you want to continue your accreditation. So therefore, there is strict quality control. So perforce, I think all teachers are expected to be trained. So that there is that kind of dire need to ensure that there is continuous and um, constant and consistent training of teachers um, that that is not confined only to the initial years of teaching um, so that no teacher becomes outdated um, and, and everyone continues to develop and hone their skills. Um, let me come to Nidhi now. Nidhi, um, NEB also talks uh, very aggressively about NEFT, which is National Educational Technical, um, you know, uh, Technical Education uh, or Technology in Education. Um, how significant do you think is the use of technology, particularly in the current context? I'm sure everyone agrees that had there been no technology, education probably would have come to a standstill. But how, 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 I mean, how do you think that we are going to be able to implement the NEFT with great efficacy under the NEP in the days to come? Um, maybe in the government schools, the schools that have the wherewithal, yes. Uh, but what about the ones who don't? Yeah, I think a valid point here with respect to, uh, you know, uh, in the current scenario, especially what would have happened in the school space or the education space per se, or even for that matter, our lives uh, in the last one and a half year. It also takes me to the point where you were talking about resilience and adaptability, right? I think that's one thing uh, that has come out truly that yes, uh, both these things are very much uh, part of the core of what we are doing. And uh, technology is here to stay. Uh, that's something uh, that's like written in bold into our faces. And the last one and a half years has proved it uh, categorically. There is no two ways about that. More important question again, as you said, is what happens in uh, the schools that are in the interiors, the schools that are you know, probably still struggling with electricity. What happens there? That's also the India that we are staying in, right? We can't uh, forget that or we can't even overlook that fact. But at the same time, we've had educators uh, coming from these same, uh, you know, places who have risen to the occasion, who have uh, taken the school to the uh, children, be it through their mobiles, be it, uh, you know, setting up some kind of the Indian Jugaad, as we say it, they've made, to they've made it happen. Uh, I think where the government is headed, it is headed in the right direction. But uh, the journey is going to be a long one uh, to be actually able to see an impact. And the sustained uh, effort needs to be there. Uh, we're talking about 21st century learner. All of us, uh, you know, rightfully say, believe and follow that we are developing the 21st century learners. And if we are talking about the 21st century learners, how can technology or the aspects related to technology be away from this? Uh, also takes me, you know, to the question that you had actually asked uh, Dr. Sami, which was on the, the teacher development or the teacher standards that are being, professional standards that are being set. And the question here is, are our teachers equipped to handle technology? To them, it comes to the students, it will come very, very naturally. We have seen that, right? But are our teachers equipped to handle uh, technology? And is the government doing enough in the right direction to be able to do that? So personally, my view is it's a long journey, but journey which uh, I think we've all uh, set on. When I say we are uh, largely not talking about our set of schools, but the ones uh, who need the support of the governments. So the set, it's been there. It can't, cannot be taken away. We are already talking about AI. AI NEP talks uh, big time, even when we are talking about assessments, student profiles, etc. They're talking about uh, AI integrated methods. Uh, so how is the, all that going to materialize if we still continue to struggle with the basics of technology? Right. So, yeah, technology is here to stay. Technology will happen, needs to happen. 
but a long way to go. Yeah, Nidhi, I think you, um, you, you've got a point there when you say technology is here and it's here to stay. And I think we are at a point of no return. Uh, so even when we come back full strength, you know, now that children have returned to school, even when we come back full strength um, and go back to our usual classrooms, uh, I, I just don't see uh, the usage of technology being relegated to the background. I think blended teaching learning is here and it's here to stay. And in fact, now I think everyone has realized probably the benefits of blended teaching learning. Um, so that, again, is going to make, um, I mean, a huge difference. Um, I, I don't think we, there, we really cannot go back to the chalk and talk anymore. Uh, my final question to Annie uh, Williams. Annie, in fact, NEB talks about, uh, higher education talks about multiple um, entry and exit points with appropriate certification. Let's say, you know, undergrad education can be uh, three or four years with, with uh, multiple exit options and uh, appropriate certification. For example, a certificate after one year, an advanced diploma after two years, a bachelor's after three years, um, maybe bachelor's with research after four years. Uh, so what is your take on that about the multiple entry and exit points? I think uh, this is a very apt question in the present scenario. Uh, many children drop out due to certain reasons at different levels, whether in school or in college or in higher education, studying in different universities in, uh, all, in all over India or abroad. And this is a very good step by the government, I would say. And it is not only for the students of uh, you know, millennium students, I would say 2000 stu uh, plus uh, the, those are born after 2000, but for us as well. So if had, it had been earlier for us, I think many of us would have tried to complete our you know, passions in our life, enjoying the things, and we would have easily done all that. So this is a very great opportunity for all the students studying in remote areas or staying in remote places financial constraints, uh, language barriers. So this will help those students to pursue their studies as and when, when they want. And that will give a certification, the accountability that yes, they are good enough to you know, rejoin and complete their studies, uh, their passion to follow. Now, yeah. uh, with this, we say when the multidisciplinary approach of education in, uh, you know, in school at school level, that same approach should be followed up in uh, higher education as well. So this has to have a bridge with plus two and or ninth to twelfth now. If we talk about NEP and the higher education, because children may may have a you know choice. Seventeen years or eighteen years, they may have a choice. Okay, I want to you know do archaeology or I want to do architecture or I want to do geology because. The, the things, the choices which we had in our times, the 45 plus and, uh, you know, the, on the other side of the 45. So what we wanted to become, I think many of us would have done something better or something less due to our choices. But still we want that, okay, now at this stage we want to know, okay, I, I if I have, like I have done my MSc in microbiology, so I wanted to do in geology as well. So if that option had been there, Maybe I would have been somewhere else. So that gives the passion, that gives the you know work. Once you become a vocationized person or a earning person, then you feel that yes, you are doing, pursuing what you are doing, what you wanted to do. And your job will not be a job anymore, and you will be happy to do it. So it will be people will be more happier to you know accept according to their languages, according to their choices. And many universities in India have come up with this course a bridge course and the liberal education has started, liberal arts have started. So I appreciate that effort that the, the NEP has already uh, thought of it. And yes, an evolution is there, but we need a revolution now. I think that is uh, what I have to submit. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. I think um, you uh, when you said that the dropout rate will reduce considerably, uh, if, you, if you allow people to uh, move at their own pace and stagger their studies, Probably. Um, I think uh, the dropout rate will reduce considerably and people can then proceed at their own pace. And uh, you'll have more and more people um, going for uh, post-secondary education. Uh, 
Uh, we now move towards the conclusion, and I would request each of you to give your uh, uh, concluding uh, remarks before we close this session. And I'd like to go uh, first to Russian. So, Russian, your concluding remarks about the efficacy. I mean, how far have we come with the NEP? I think responsibility is with schools. The NEP um, is, is more like a vision document uh, containing a set of good practices and uh, ideals to strive towards. It's not really a, a concrete policy yet, and I think it will need to be followed up with strong policies. But in the meantime, basically, uh, good schools, progressive schools, progressive school leaders and teachers should have already been prior to the NEP implementing those practices and should continue to do so. Um, and the NEP can be a good base on which other schools can try to uh, follow that, but we should not wait. There's no need to wait for the policy. It's, it's simply a document on good educational practice which all schools should be striving towards anyway. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're right, it's a, it's vision and policies will follow, hardcore concrete policies will follow, uh, but good schools will take uh, this vision forward using their own initiative. Um, Dan, your concluding remarks, please. Yes, much like uh, Russian said, I think that the details are gonna be important. So the NEP has a good direction, it has a good vision, it incorporates the keys to what we know are uh, parts of good education, parts of good strategy, parts of good instruction. But how will that look when it comes to developing assessment, for example? Or how will it look when it comes to, uh, we talked earlier about you know, teacher preparation, ongoing professional development, and then how will those things be supported not only Obviously, in our schools, we may be in a, a different situation, but in all the schools, in all the situations throughout the country, uh, how how is that going to look when it's on the ground? Um, I think uh, someone had mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, us taking the lead, um, or maybe I was watching a different session, but, uh, you know, we can take the lead in, in um, developing, professionally developing teachers, and preparing them for this NEP future, uh, but how do we impact the larger society? And then what's that again, what is, what's it gonna look like when it comes down to, uh, will the assessments and will all the policies that follow match the same vision uh, that's laid out in the NEP? Thank you, Dan. And Nidhi, your take, uh, your, your final concluding remarks, please. Yeah, thanks, Nita. Uh, yeah, I think what Roshan said very right. This is a vision document, a step in the right uh, direction. I think uh, progressive, uh, definitely, definitely a progressive uh, step, whether we talk from the student perspective, uh, whether we talk from the uh, teacher perspective, or uh, if I talk about the general education space, uh, whether it's school space or higher ed. So an extremely progressive document. Uh, and I would be surprised that uh, if you were to tell me that at least the schools that all of us are representing uh, would not be do already doing what's there in this uh, vision document. I think we are already uh, doing all of that, uh, but strengthening what is there and taking it to the larger uh, populace. Uh, putting in those, uh, you know, uh, what are those 10 things, 15 things or 20 things that each school will have to do? Uh, to take this vision, make this vision document a reality. I think that's where uh, the policies will have to be very strong. The implementation monitoring will have to be very strong. Otherwise, uh, sad to say, we'll have to go the CCE route, uh, which was such a, if you ask me, CCE was again uh, more aligned to what we are again talking now, right? But um, it went in the south direction only because of the way it was implemented. So I think Absolutely. monitoring what's Absolutely. being implemented Absolutely. is going to be of imperative. I think you're uh, so right. Uh, a lot of us are already doing what is mentioned in the vision document. Uh, but as you very rightly said, it's a matter of uh, policy making, implementation of those policies, and of course, monitoring to what degree and with what efficacy are uh, we uh, able to implement these policies. Uh, Dr. Samiola, your closing remarks, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with all my fellow panelists. Uh, NAP is definitely a visionary uh, one. Uh, gives a balanced and holistic structure uh, that paves, you know, the way for all uh, 
uh, all on every child successful academic or skill performance at uh, at lower levels to higher level uh, be it in the college or or in the in the school level her the, the child's emotional well being is taken care uh, it lays foundation of uh, you know fun field stress free uniform child centric uh, learning so the impact of this anyway the crucial education reform will be visible in the coming uh, decades so to say and considerably enhanced uh, you know the dividend uh, that we can see we are the english population in the world the largest english so hopefully it will uh, pave the way for a globally comp uh, competent working population and, and it serves the nation yeah over to you dr nit thank you thank you dr sangmira uh, any your your remarks before we conclude i will uh, make it quick uh the point is like all the panelists have said that yes uh we have to work on different areas this is just a vision and reach the mission of it we have to decentralize and give onus to the state government education departments as well so that it can be implemented hand in hand with the central thought and including lot lot many more educationists into the panel of implementation rather than you know it is it is not one side or one part of it so more of educationists should come up with their ideas and yes like the our constitution the adoption so we have to adopt many good things from other boards as well so looking forward to a great implementation process as well and achieving the goals thank you thank you thank you so much for joining us on this uh, discussion uh, i think this has been a very fruitful and a very enriching discussion every every panelist has put forward fantastic views um and a whole gamut of ideas um, that we have discussed uh during this panel discussion and so for me it's 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 been a very gratifying experience thank you roshan dr samyuda thank you dan thank you for joining us nidhi thapar and annie williams thank you so much and have a great great evening ahead thank, thank you so, you so much. much yeah thank, thank you. you thank you thank, thank you, you. Bye. bye bye